things were said. So today we're going to talk about responsible production and consumption, both linked hand in hand. Uh, it's human goal number 12. So there are 17 goals. And the whole aim is that for sustainability to kind of promote and scale, and you'll hear a lot during the day with our panelists today, is that it's it's all driven by consumer consciousness. The more consumers participate, the more consumers uh, demand for sustainable products, sustainable solutions, the more there will be a supply, there will be more production. So it's kind of linked production and consumption are both linked together. And that's why we've brought two amazing people here today uh, who are really personally very green people I know and who have part of the production and the consumption side of the chain. So it's a good merger at today's webinar. And I'd just like to introduce our organization for some of you who are already friends and family of where you are. Uh, this is just an overview of where we are. And for all the new people who have joined, where you are, Green Life is a social environment enterprise. We established ourselves 10 years ago with a vision to create eco-conscious citizens. So are you reducing, reusing, recycling? The three R's is what we promote and propagate. And uh, it's really been amazing since April, we have done over 12 to 14 webinars uh, where we have mainly reached out to people to raise their eco consciousness because the first step in adopting sustainability is behavioral change. It has to become a an habit. And that's what RER first promotes eco education. And under that umbrella, we are here today at the webinar on understanding UN SDG number 12. And we also are promoting and designing and developing sustainable and decentralized waste management solutions. So focus actually is on waste management, which actually links to consumption. So we aim to tell people to reduce their waste, to ensure it's recyclable, to adopt products that can be composted or recycled. So production, consumption is all linked to the three R's and do waste management, the work we do. And one of the projects that we are fully focused on is biocomposting, where we convert kitchen waste into compost, like a circular economy. I think composting is the most circular, uh, sustainable process, like cradle to cradle, what you eat gets composted, goes back into the soil, and we grow again plants, fruits, vegetables from that. So we have now, uh, in our last 10 years, we've developed an innovative in-vessel technology. It's patent filed and Green Pro certified by the Indian Green Building Council. That's our aerobic biocomposter. Mm -hmm. And we have now happily uh, reached a scale of 130 projects across India. We just exported our first set of biocomposters to Malaysia. And one of our composters is on the ship going to Henning in Germany. So we are kind of going out of India. That's a really nice uh, news to share. And through 130 projects, we are able to recycle over 500 tons of biodegradable waste across the year annually, year on year. Uh, so every kilogram counts, as they say. It's still a small number, but the idea is that we are saving carbon emissions by ensuring the waste is composted at source. So that's one of our key projects. We also work with Tetra Pak. Uh, on a CSR EPR project. EPR is Extended Producers Responsibility. So it talks about how responsible production can ensure recyclability. So one of the products that we recycle is Tetra Pak cartons. And again, certified for recycling, as you see, there is a FSC label. That's Forest Stewardship Certified Label. So labeling is very important in responsible production for people to know is the product really certified. So when you look for the label, this shows that the paper source to make this carton is from a safe forest, a sustainable forest. So that's when you look for your labels, it helps you to make sure you're consuming a sustainable product. And we're going to talk about more kinds of labeling for different products in the session today. This product is then recycled to make something like this, a pen stand. So this, in this program, we run a program in Mumbai City where you can recycle your empty tetra pack cartons, deposit them, and convert them into different products. So this is a little bit about Ariva, and I'd like to introduce our first panelists of the day, Kanishtha and then Henny, and um, we'll open the floor to discussions after that. So Kanishtha 
is a dear friend of mine actually and we've known each other for a couple of years and we connect, got connected by a go green with touch back project because she was uh, very motivated to do something for the environment and she reached out to us and asked, saying how can i help spread awareness on your project and that's how we connected so kanishka she uh, like every other citizen who should take the first leap to join a movement because individually there's not so much you can do when you want to make a change you become part of a movement you can make a greater change so i think kanishka is here with us who's been part of the program with us and she is actually crowned Pageant of Femina Miss India. So she is a model, a supermodel actually. Uh, she also, uh, you know, works with many brands to promote their designs, and some of them are sustainable and uh, you know organic and fair trade. So she is the right person to talk about how fashion trends can make a difference. So, uh, in spite of her busy career in terms of you know working on her uh, modeling and, and many other things that she does. she practices a lot of green practices at home and we know each other she goes out of her way to kind of learn more about what she can do as an individual to go green so she's going to share about her journey here today and we also have another close friend of mine henning henning is from germany and uh, henning is a founder of a company called mela bear a truly sustainable 100% organic a uh, got certified cradle to cradle reaching cradle to cradle organization so he's the guru in in hindi we say guru he's like the my bab the guru of uh, you know what sustainability a brand can do and, and he has amazing shoes backpacks and t-shirts and i as a consumer have used all three and i love them and they are really sustainable so it's a brand that we all have used i mean at least i have used and uh, i think all of you should know more about his journey and his story and henry is a really uh, you know a really green guy cuz i've seen him i've gone on treks with him you know so much about the plants the trees the grass uh, mushrooms uh, he is really uh, somebody who's grown up in the woods so he knows sustainability he goes kayaking he sends these amazing pictures of you know doing a lot of stuff in nature so he's the right guy to have here so warm welcome and namaste to you henry and his friend larissa who's also a dear friend of mine uh, she's with him who's also lived in india for a few years uh, is also part of the panel so welcome both kanishka and henny and now i'd like to request uh, henny to share about responsible production about his experience in starting a sustainable fashion brand and what it takes to make sustainability a reality Okay, I thought that since we're speaking about sustainable fashion today, I would just, you know, like to think about what sort of comes to our mind and what are the first few words that uh, come to all of our minds. And if I think about it, for me, it would be trying to recycle our clothes or re or use recycled polyester or made handmade garments and things like that. But also, sustainable fashion. What we don't know and what we don't realize is that there's a human element to it. and the fact that there are people you know in the movement so also so fashion has a impact on the environment so for me it means that we understand that the present cannot impact the future generation so how we kind of create things now is going to impact the future generation we also need to understand that this is a real problem that we face that uh, you know apart from just owning a lot of clothes what all of us what most people feel is that a t-shirt shouldn't cost more than 300 rupees that's the average person's want or need but what again we don't understand is that if something cost 300 rupees how was it made how did it arrive to the store was it ethically produced ethically in terms of the impact on the environment and human you know and humans and the social aspect that it has and of course if it's produced in an unethical way how it gets uh you know uh, how you kind of get rid of your clothes is that ethical and that brings me to this next slide which is a big problem of landfills and there are so many textile landfills in india especially that we don't know about we have three textile landfills 
in and outside of Delhi itself. There's one near Uttar Pradesh, there's one near Haryana, and there's also one in the center of the city in Okhla. And what happens is, apart from just textile waste, these landfills get filled up with all different kinds of waste. Despite of, you know, uh, despite of having these landfills, we also have a lot of trash that we just see in India because there's no proper waste management. In this slide, you can see that it says, in landfills, waste is generally placed underneath the ground surface in an area of land which is first lined with clay and then covered with a sheet of flexible plastic. Drains and pipes are also placed to collect a liquid which seeps out of the trash, which is then treated as wastewater. But as with the failed or non-existent liners and covers for the older landfills, various hazardous components such as heavy metals and volatile substances enter the groundwater, making it unfit for human consumption. And this is a huge impact on environment because groundwater is a limited resource which, once polluted, is very, very hard and expensive to clean. So we need to understand that sustainable fashion is about improving the social, environment and economic footprint. And what this takes me to is the next slide, which means that we each can make a difference, that the power does lie in our own hands. And this is where responsible consumption comes in. We have a lot of individual power to choose and how we choose is basically how we choose to spend our money. So if we stop spending our hard earned money on products that are not really good for us or the environment, that eventually leads uh, producers to start thinking about what they're doing, how they're producing. So once you educate yourself as a consumer, you can sort of be the chain, be the link of the chain that really is needed for the movement to go ahead. And this brings me to holding the producers responsible. So it's important that producers take responsibility and accountability for how they produce. As a conscious consumer, when you start to question, how is this made? How has this t-shirt landed on my table today or in my wardrobe today? You know, who made it? Was this person paid well? What kind of environmental impact did it have on its journey from the factory to here? I think all these things are really important to understand. So putting sustainability in the heart of the business and, you know, moving towards a circular economy, which basically means zero waste, reducing, reusing and recycling. Also, how much is enough? The average person buys 60% more items of clothing every year and keeps it for about half as long. Whereas if you had to compare this to the previous generations, to your grandparents' generation, it would probably be the opposite. Your grandparents would probably buy half the number of clothes and keep them for double as long. So these are things to think about when you're thinking about responsible consumption. Because we can't just keep consuming more and more, hoping that new technologies will fix our sustainability challenges for us. You know, we have one planet and it has limited resources. So as conscious consumers, we need to understand these really simple facts. Because if we just think that, oh, you know, I'll take it and then there'll be a new technology and I just get rid of it. That's not enough. That's just like thinking that after the COVID, all these masks that we use and dispose are just going to sort of disappear off the face of the planet. That's not going to happen. You know, we all have to think about how we, uh, how we are responsible for what we consume, and that is our waste. I also want to just link this to how textile waste contributes to climate change, because I feel that's really important, and that ties into sustainability 100%. Basically, the depletion of natural resources and the increasing amount of textile waste are key contributors to climate change, and they are linked. Takes me back to landfills, which were not designed to break down waste. They were only there to store it until you knew what to do with it. So what happens in landfills is that methane is produced, and a lot of it. Methane is a potent greenhouse gas which is about 25 to 72 times more potent than carbon dioxide. And we all know that carbon dioxide is the biggest contributor to global warming. Methane is actually number two. And here you see climate models suggest that continued increases in methane level 
could see global temperatures increasing by three to four degrees Celsius. And if you know about the Paris Climate Summit, we are trying to keep the increase in temperature to 1.5 or two maximum. So it's just really important to see how climate change and textile and fashion and all of, all of these three are linked together and how conscious consumption actually helps us move forward towards a better world and uh, also being responsible you know, at how we contribute and impact the environment. And so the solution that I think is the way and the only way is segregation at source. It's proper waste management of anything that we consume, whether it's food or shoes or, you know, empty Tetra Pak cartons or anything for that matter. And we all can be the change we want to see in the world by just educating ourselves. So I just want to share with you a few brands that are based out of India that are practicing a very sustainable green practice. There's 1111. They use only hand woven fabrics and natural dyes. So in this slide, you can see a couple of other brands that Malai is uh, basically means the flesh of the coconut. So these uh, Malai is the name of the brand and they're making vegan leather shoes and there's All Live and Anoki, which has a lot of sustainable garments. There's also Unico, which are providing sustainable solutions to stationery. Um, and there is the Better India. They provide products that are non-toxic for everyday consumption and they also don't pollute water. And uh, there is this website called I Say Organic where you actually can buy your vegetables and fruits for your own consumption. And these are just a few things that I wanted to share with you today that maybe you can, you know, have a hint of what to use and in India. And just a little bit of a slide from me to educate and help educate the movement of sustainability as a whole. Thank you so much for listening. Thanks, Kanishta. That was uh, really mindful for us to reflect on how we can, you know, must adopt sustainable products. And here we have now Henning. And I'm going to share the presentation, Henning, from my side. And uh, we'll hopefully it will work. So that's uh, just give me a second. Are you able to see it? Uh, not yet. Okay. All right, so I can also try it again. Sorry, also you yeah. mentioned Delaware, which we are now going to see from heading side. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. Um, I'm just going to try it again. One minute. I can also try it and show once again. Yeah, one minute. Huh? I'm going to give it a try again. Okay, you're trying it? All right. Yeah. One but I don't know how, if you can see the presentation. I, it's open now, but I don't know if you see it. Okay, let me try. I will try. try One minute. Slide, Henning, and then you can see if it moves. Yeah, I think I got it. Is it working now, Henning? Uh, yeah. Okay, so good to go. Yeah, okay. Yeah. So uh, basically, um, Mela is singing. And uh, stands for, I mean, we translate it as acting together, but Mela, I mean, you all know better than I do, it's a festival, a joy place, a gathering, it's something when um, people come together to either trade or to have a festival, maybe religious or cultural event. So that's where the name comes from, actually, Mela, where it's taken from, from the Hindi um, word Mela. And for us, it's a very positive word, and we when we uh, launched the company in 2014, the aim was to create something that makes fun and joy and that people can enjoy because fashion and clothing uh, normally is about something that people like a lot, that they desire and um, where they um, want to consume also. But as we uh, heard rightly from Kanish, is that there's a lot of um, issues involved in the textile industry, in the garment industry, and we try with our model to overcome that, but still have an option for people to enjoy fashion. Yeah, that's uh, what we do. And here's a small overview on, on what we do or uh, what I'm going to present. I and mean, we can straight away with the next slide, I think. Um, yeah, it, it's founded in 2014, so basically six years ago. 
and we launched our first product in 2015. In April, it was a basic 100% organic cotton fair trade certified t-shirt. We produced 10,000 t-shirts, half for men, half for women, and we shipped them to Germany. And I presented them to the retail shops and also to end consumers. And um, of course, there were many uh, people offering t-shirts in the market by that time. So it was not really attractive or very special, but what was special about it was that we managed to achieve a lower retail price and a good, a good margin for the wholesalers so that even from day one we were successful to enter into the retail market with our products and um, we are fair trade cotton certified we are global organic textile certified for some of our products we use cradle to cradle gold certified materials to make the product fully um, staying in the loop and at the moment we actually did um, all figures from 2018 at the moment we are 18 people where five are full-time and um, 13 are part-time. And our products come all from India, except the sold from the sneakers, which are from organic rubber. They come from Sri Lanka. And for backpacks and sneakers, we are the only brand in the world that has a fair trade and organic um, textile standard certified um, product in the market. Yeah, and um, the retailers we are working with, it's mainly, as it said, there is a retail stores, but we are also present in the conventional market, so we try to sell on Amazon. And we also have tied up with Zalando and About You. Both of them are the biggest online retailers in, in Europe for fashion. And um, so we try to take up the conventional market. Yeah. So this is showing uh, basically a visit that we did together with our partner, Pure Cots. Um, Ami Narko is also there, and also the farmers from Noble Ecotech. That was last year, it was a press trip. And uh, for us, it's important to know the entire supply chain. Of course, we cannot go to all stages all the time, but most and um, most and many of the partners that we work with, we visit them personally. We try to stay in touch with them. So not only tier one, but also tier two or three to really make sure that we know where the products are coming from. And thanks to Fairtrade, we are able to track all our products from the field to the end consumer. So we have a tracking code that is already in all of our garments. So end consumers might not even know what it stands for, but there's a small number. And if we would like to, or if we want to include it in the future with that number, you can type it into our system, or we have that system from our end. We can figure out where was the, the cotton grown, where was it harvested, and where, where was the ginning, spinning, weaving, and so on, so that we can really give some guidance to the end consumers. And mainly it's about, it's a complex supply chain, for a garment, I mean, it seems to be a very basic and easy product. Um, if you're based in India, you're much more familiar with the cotton or a garment industry than if you're based in Europe, because people in Europe, they have lost the knowledge on how a garment is made. They don't know the efforts that are taken to make a product. That's why, I mean, we heard that before in the presentation, where people are willing to pay in India 300 rupees or three to four euros in Germany for a t-shirt. It's something that's almost impossible to manage if you look at the complex supply chain that we normally have. And um, so a lot of things are involved which increase the cost that we have to take into consideration when it comes to costing in a sustainable um, textile. It doesn't end when the product is sold. So we are at Miller where we make products that are purely made out of cotton. So we don't mix or blend them with anything. Um, we have a uh, the option to take back products in the end of their usage phase. So here I'd say it's a life cycle of a cotton shirt. That's mainly what industry or also um, science tells us. They talk about life cycle. That's what we learn in business schools so or at university. But to be honest, the t-shirt, it's not a, something that was alive. So it can also not die. It's rather a cycle. So we sh should call it the production phase and the usage phase. And the left side of this, of this circle shows after we have bought the t-shirt and we have worn it for a certain time, what will happen to it? And we have seen this images in India from the landfill and this frozen, and we try to avoid it by closing the loop, by taking the garment back and making a new one out of it. That's uh, the vision of Melaware, where we fully um, cycle for the fashion. Yeah, you can go to the next one. And we heard this also before, I think we can skip this. We have to be first aware that the Emission is very high, even for production of a basic T-shirt, it's 11 kg CO2 emission. So it's very important to not just buy it and throw it away, but to have a closed loop to make something out of it. 
This is something very interesting. It's taken from a study. You can also read it. It's from two German professors, Hansen and Scheidegger, and they. It's an it's an English paper. If you look uh, for it, it's called um, "One Hundred Percent Organic: A Sustainable Entrepreneurship Perspective on the Diffusion of Organic Cotton." Clothing. Um, uh, this presentation can also be shared afterwards, or you take a screenshot if you're interested. Um, you can see. Uh, for cotton, on the left side, that we have social aspects involved, like labor rights, wages, uh, overtime, social standards, but we also have um, ecological aspects involved, like do we use organic seeds, do we use organic dyes, are the trims that we use um, healthy, or do they contain something that might be toxic? That is on the left side, and then it comes from the fiber production up to the end of usage phase, um, you have to cover all aspects uh, when it comes to your product. So where we use fair trade certified organic cotton, which is on the left bottom, it's just about the fiber production. But that's where our global organic textile standard starts to make sure that the social and ecological aspects within the entire supply chain are taken care of. And on the far right, you can see there's only one standard, standard at the moment that you can apply to parts is the cradle to cradle standard. So if you combine all three of this, you're very close when it comes to natural fibers to have a, a, a product that is highly sustainable. Yes. Uh, for the ones who didn't know how the labels look like, so for consumers, it's very important how can I recognize if a product is certified and sustainable or not, because many brands or companies, they have um, products where they claim they are organic or fair or sustainable, but uh, we only uh, trust in third party audits. So that's why we use the Fairfax Cotton Standard for making sure that the weakest part in the supply chain, the Fairfax Cotton Farmer in India, gets a certain amount and the premium on top to make sure that they can make a living out of it. And the Global Organic Textile Standard helps us if we send our products um, to the laboratory to test them against certain chemicals. And the cradle to cradle concept helps our product designers and ourselves to make sure that the products are. Um, uh, produced and designed in such a way that we can reuse them after the usage phase. Um, we do only products out of um, natural fibers like organic cotton. If you look into um, other fibers, natural fibers or even um, uh, man-made fibers like polyester, other standards apply. So I can only talk for the natural fibers, and especially organic cotton. So um, for other fibers, you have some different um, uh, standards here. And this is a small overview. I think you can keep scrolling so people can see what we do. You can also check it on um, www.medaware.de slash pn for English version. This backpack, for example, that you can see here is a um, world's only fair trade and organic certified backpack. It's now also nominated for the German uh, Sustainability Award from the German government. So it contains only natural materials um, we have um, uh, used in that backpack. And it sells for 100 euro in the retail shop here, which is close to what uh, conventional brands also ask for the backpacks. Sometimes they're even more expensive from similar material, but not being certified by using organic material. So we are quite competitive. Uh, and I think the next slides give you some um, information on the sneaker also. Um, the Greenpeace uh, Energy, which belongs to Greenpeace NGO, that many people know all our sneakers to be the most sustainable sneakers in the world because we achieved to get them organic certified. And the main challenge was the sole and also the glue. So we use a water-based glue and um, we use a sole where we use organic rubber. Yeah. That's the key. You can see the sneaker. Normally a sneaker is made out of 50 materials we try to make it only a maximum 25 to make it more easy. It's still tricky enough. So that was a two years R&D project that we invested <clears throat> around 100,000 euros to get it ready for the market. And we are still uh, working on it to improve it. So we have sold 20,000 pairs so far. The early stage product still for us. And so yeah, this is the website. You can look it up. Also, we are on Instagram. Um, where we uh, post and where we do stories and feeds and try to inform consumers also. Um, that's um, a must for fashion companies. Uh, and uh, then the next slide is showing also that we are um, doing a podcast. This is more um, related to where we get insights. So we also have podcasts in English, both English and German. It's on Spotify and iTunes. So we inform about 
sustainability um, and social change. Also, we had a podcast very interesting with Monisha uh, a few sessions back. It was session 21. So you can check it out on, on uh, Spotify um, and, and look for that. Um, and in that image, you can see that there was last year we uh, took a group of interested people to India to show them our supply chain. So on the very left is also Larissa, who is next to me. She has been working in India five years with the uh, Indo German Chamber of Commerce. Next to her is Marie Nasemann. She's Germany's next top model from a few decades ago. So we're also into sustainable fashion. And then an online magazine um, who went with us, and um, another influencer from Instagram, Daria. Daria, she, so all together, this group, they have around the reach of one million people in Germany that they spread the word of sustainable textiles when we took them to Germany. So here you can see the participants. We visited Maral overseas in um, a indoor at that time in the Fair Trade Organic Cotton. Yeah. The next slides are showing all the impressions from that trip. Um, Marvin Azaman and um, those together. Yes. On our website, there's also a documentary um, about our sneaker and the trip. You can find it in the section about us if you're interested to see more about it. It's also with English subtitles. And um, yeah, we have different growth perspectives at the moment. Um, mainly, um, we want to really get into the um, market for conventional buyers and end consumers. We want to sell them sustainable textiles and garments and they don't have to be very conscious about it. So we try to tackle them with the price and the design and the marketing. And um, if they're just a little bit willing to to try something out that is sustainable or organic, they can find it at Millerware. But we don't want to overemphasize on our sustainability approach because as I said in the beginning, it's still fashion. People want to enjoy it and we as a brand, as a company, we have to make sure that we do our level best in the supply chain and in the production and with our partners. But the consumers have to have a very easy access and step to approach it. So it should be almost as convenient as conventional fashion. Yeah. Thank you very much. And yeah, as Manisha said, we are also happy to answer questions or get in touch uh, now also in a panel discussion. Wow, that was really a uh, great insight, Henny. I love the cotton pictures. And uh, I, I think uh, Henny is one person who's kind of you know, made sure that he's got the story from field to fashion uh, dotted and ensure that the whole chain from the field, from the farmer, interacting with them, uh, building a relationship with the cotton, making sure the, the fashion industry, the influencers, uh, as he got some models here, like Daria Daria with the Raj Reach, to kind of see the whole supply chain, to kind of endorse the movement in India and take it back to Germany. So that's why I feel a very close connection with Melabair. Its name itself is uh, with its roots in India. So we are a family. And it's really uh, amazing to see. And I was really happy to hear where uh, now Melabair is available on Amazon. I mean, is on the same platform as conventional shirts, that means it's making itself available, affordable, and attractive to consumers. So a lot of uh, myths about uh, you know sustainable products are expensive. You know, it's only meant for the rich, or it's only meant for people who really, really want to go green. It's not mainstream. It's not fashion. So uh, maybe Kanishtha, what do you think about uh, sustainable products? Can they become mainstream? Can they become the de facto norm? I mean, our vision would be that you know, uh, sustainable products that everybody uses, and the conventional products are not really that you know, adopted so much. So, do you think there's a trend uh, moving towards that? And do you think there's a long way? And is it affordable for people? I was saying that I agree with what Henning said that. You know, it has to be easy for consumers to be able to access sustainable products because at the moment, uh, A, there's, uh, there's a movement forming and there are conscious consumers who exist. For example, maybe all of us who are here today, we know that we want to be part of the sustainable movement. So we will go out of our way to either produce like Henning is or as conscious consumers to find products that are sustainable. But I think for it to become more accessible to the masses, for example, if I talk about India, it has to be affordable. It has to be, you know, education driven. But I feel that there is a possibility to do it because if you look at the history of Indian textile, 
if we had to go back to do it, doing things the way we did, but making it affordable for people, it could become, uh, you know, a norm where maybe uh, all kinds of brands would have to move and take a sustainable sort of path because the consumer doesn't want to buy anything else. He doesn't want to buy fast fashion because he knows where, how that happened and how that came. But then for that to happen again, the product needs to be affordable and easy to access. So, but yeah, I feel like there is a movement. It is growing. There are a lot of options and it might be slow. It's not that things are going to change tomorrow or maybe in the next uh, two or three years, but I feel like where we are at today, it will grow. Great. Henning, you want to add to that? Any thoughts on mainstreaming sustainable products? Yeah, basically in, uh, in Europe, um, it depends on the country uh, regarding the trend, but especially in Germany and also in Austria, Switzerland, um, the trend is quite um, big at the moment. And the mainstream buyers, uh, retail shops and onlineers, they are looking into certified and uh, sustainable textiles. So after the food where um, organic certified products are already available in mainstream supermarkets and um, discounters, um, now the garment and textile industry is a product um, that is in the focus of the major and bigger um, retailers. Um, so the demand is definitely growing and we can see it in the numbers. Not, I mean, not talking only about Mailerware or growth, but especially overall. And also the fact that the German government launched a new standard for the textile industry, which is called Green Button from the Ministry of Foreign um, Development and um, Economic Growth. They, there's, a, there's a focus on that topic. And um, I think um, the demand will definitely take up, at least in this region in Europe, and the ideas that other countries will follow. But it's of course, it's about also whether people are willing to pay more and um, accepting a little bit higher prices and maybe it's uh, Germany, Austria, Switzerland, they, they, they are conscious, but also they can afford it to buy it. But um, if, if the demand grows and the supply is also there, the prices might be a little bit higher than at present, but it's not that sustainable fashion uh, would be out of space and extremely more expensive. So, so it's something that can definitely be achieved and also paid for by the buyers and the customers. So the, 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 the money would be there, yeah. Yeah, that's good to know. And I think I am happy to hear that governments, even in India, uh, there is a lot of movement uh, by the Ministry of Environment and Forestry to you know push for responsible production, push extended producers' responsibility. And I think affordability is about how much you use a product. I think if people were to, as Hanisha said, you know, if you bought half the products and use them over and over again, it would automatically become affordable because you'd value what you bought and you kind of take care of it with giving it a longer use and therefore you would be willing to pay that extra price for it. Uh, you know, I've used Henning's backpack for uh, many years. My kids have used it. It's pretty rugged. Uh, you know, we've taken it around uh, on trips. And uh, so I think if you reuse and this, you know, preserve, uh, things will become affordable. Uh, I request people uh, in the audience, all our friends here, you may put some questions down in the chat box. Uh, I will try to pick them up from there and ask to our panelists. So just uh, to make it easy, uh, we request you to write the questions down. So one question is, Henning, this one's for you. Does Melaware support living wages for workers? And if so, what is it you are doing to ensure this? Living yeah. wages, and Henning's a king on that, so I think he's going to talk about Yeah, that. so basically um, what most, then all of the standards that are available in the market at the moment, they focus on the minimum wage, which by some countries is called the living wage. So if the Indian government says, um, um, if they talk about living wage, it's actually what the NGOs and the standards call the minimum wage. So um, we try, I mean, as per the standards, we have to pay the minimum wage, but as a brand, we want to encourage the living wage. And to give you an example, um, in most of the regions in India, uh, for the, the ones who work as uh, basic tailors, it would mean almost doubling their income. And um, we have calculated it together with Fairtrade Germany in the new standard where we are a pilot partner. How much does it mean in terms of higher cost for the garment? 
and we come to something closer to five to ten percent more that we have to pay it's closer to five percent and uh, together with our garment producer pure Cots, we are in a pilot project where we are accepting over the next five years to increase the prices or to pay more for the garments so that over the period of five years we we achieve an increase of five percent uh, to allow living wages but the, the true story is we are just one brand a small brand producing at, uh, at the factory so we need all the other brands that are producing organic tech sets to step in so we are front runner to demonstrate that it is possible but it will only work out if the other brands are also supporting because our stake in the factory is always between uh, two and five percent depending how quick we grow or the producer grows and we do it only with the garment manufacturer who does the textiles because for example we have a manufacturer for backpacks he's in Calcutta or we had a sneaker manufacturer he was closer to Chennai or Velour and they are not very keen on starting a, a, a living wage project because uh, they are not in the stage that in their area they can um, um, argue it against other factory owners and they don't have other brands that are willing to step in so it always needs someone to take a first step and uh, in the long run, we want to pay it and we are even offering it to all our producers, but not all of them are accepting it. So um, it will only work out if either Melaware grows really big or if other brands support and step in. But to be honest, it's one of the most important and um, challenging topics at this time because if you really want to have a sustainable product and you want to be fair, it's all about the money and the wages. And um, so far, most most standards, almost most standards, tackling it. Yeah, that's right. Thanks, Kenny. It's about social, environment, and economic, right? All three need to come together uh, to make a product sustainable. Uh, and that's why I think living wages plays a pivotal role. Uh, Kanishka, there's a question from you, from Aditi. Do you see, uh, you know, brands, fashion industry in India and all over the world, uh, you know, when you go for... Uh, fashion convention or a show do you see them changing to sustainable products and uh, sustainable designs and what are the materials that they are using i do i feel like there's been a big movement uh, in the fashion industry i think it started around 10 years ago where lots of young people and young designers are so i like the heart of the business model is sustainability and they're using handloom fabrics they're focusing on khadi and there's been a big uh, revival of Khadi in India. So there is a huge movement in the Indian fashion industry. However, we have to realize that there were many brands that have already been established for a long time. So for them to change the way we do things, it's going to take time. You can't expect these are the nuances of the industry where you need to understand when something is happening a certain way, they can't stop production and stop doing everything they were doing and they adopt a new way of doing something. So I feel like, especially after the COVID happened, a lot of designers as well, big established designers decided that sustainability suddenly is a very important topic for them. Because also I think losing the daily uh, sort of workers losing uh, people from because of all the migrant populations going back to their villages to find work. I think all of that has brought even more consciousness into the way things are happening. Uh, apart from that, we also need to understand that good designers in India also employ a lot of the artisans, which keep all techniques alive. So even though they might be combining modern technology to create garments, they also have a lot of artisans that are still contributing to uh, you know, the current fashion that we see. And also the employment that that generates in a country like India. You know, I think there is almost uh, 4 million people that work in the Indian fashion industry, 4 million artisans. So we need to understand that 4 million artisans feeding 4 million families in India. So while it's important that we move towards sustainability, uh, all of these nuances combined together will have to move parallelly, hand in hand. Because you can't then suddenly expect like 1 million people to be out of work. So I feel that this is a growing, growing uh, sort of movement. And yes, designers are taking an initiative, maybe not all of them, 
but some of them. And I feel like eventually in the future, sustainability probably won't be a thing we're going to discuss like this. It's just going to be the norm. It's going to be like, yeah, you don't do that. Yeah. You, you know? So I hope that on that note, uh, it takes a reality. Yes, I wish that sustainability becomes a norm and that's the aim of uh, what we do at RUR to make it mainstream. There's a question for you, Henning. Uh, what about the colors and the dyes uh, in the fabric? Uh, how do you ensure they have low toxicity or low impact on the environment? And what are companies doing to produce sustainable dyes? A couple of people have asked this question. Yes. So, um, and when we started, uh, we visited and discovered different ways of doing the dyes. One is natural dyes, um, herbal dyes, then um, the other option is chemical dyes. And then when it comes to chemical dyes, you have two options at that time when we started. It. We uh, had all that were Global Organic Extra Standard certified. So we are, in the end, we could not use herbal or um, natural dyes because we don't, we would not be able to scale in the long run and we would not be able to maintain the quality over time because our business model is also in such a way that we um, design a product and we um, keep it in the stock for two or three years. So it's a never out of stock item. So we reproduce the same, which makes life easier for the producer and for us. Um, and we need to have the same red color in the following season. So we cannot take use of the natural dyes, but there are very good certified chemical dyes that are organic certified and um, that you can use. And how do we ensure that they really meet our standard is that each and any lot that we produce, we ship it to SGS, it's a Swiss laboratory. They have several bases in India. We work with the one in um, Chennai. And even if it's a repeat style from each production, we send it to the laboratory and get it tested against heavy chemicals, heavy metals, um, chlorophenol, um, um, you know, all kind of uh, ingredients that might cause cancer that are forbidden or restricted in the organic standard. So that's how we ensure it. And um, then we have even launched a t-shirt collection in 2018, which we produce with chemical dyes that are cradle to cradle gold certified. So these dyes are optimized to be exposed to nature. In other words, if you put these dyes or any uh, process chemicals or even your, your, your garment into um, landfill, it will not be um, waste, but rather be nutrient for the planet. So these dyes go beyond organic because they become nutrient for the planet. And our ultimate goal is to make sure that all our products are made with credit to credit sold, gold certified dyes. The limitation at the moment is not so much the availability, but the, the cost that are involved to get the certified dyes into our supply chain. And we are too small to push our bigger producers, mainly the fabric and dyeing units to use them exclusively for us. The more we grow, the more realistic it will come that we can use this credit to credit gold certified dyes. Bigger companies are doing it in India already on a large scale, like CNA. Wow. Yeah, that's, I love the idea of nutrient rich dyes. I mean, composting uh, replenishes nutrients into the soil. And I think one of the biggest global issues is soil remediation, land. So we're talking about air where we want uh, air, water, and land. And I think emission control, you know, dyes impact the water stream as well, uh, and also the soil. So I think it's very, very important for uh, governments to, you know, put environment laws in place, especially for dying companies, where um, they take care of air, land, and water in terms of the ecological impact. And I, I see a question here about what do you think governments uh, can do or are doing to make populations more invested in sustainable fashion. Uh, anybody, Kanishta or Henning, want to take this up? What, what do you think governments can do or are doing to help us? Webhavi has asked this question. I think in India, um, we do have big support, especially from the Ministry of Textile. We have a day at Lakme Fashion Week, which is one of the biggest fashion weeks in the country that is solely dedicated to sustainable fashion. Manisha, actually, you were part of that day last yes, year. That's right. You are there. Um, and I feel like there is an initiative and there is a movement. However, I feel that there is a lack of education. So while the government is doing its bit uh, along with the designers and certain bodies, there is no mainstream education of the problem. 
So it needs to, this topic needs to be addressed on a day-to-day -day basis because clothing is something that we on a day-to-day -day basis. So I feel that um, the government is doing its, its, its part, but not as proactively as I would like it to. Or as I feel that it's actually making an impact of educating the consumer. So a lot more can be done on that end. Uh, I'd like to request Kishore Naik to mute yourself, please. Kishore Naik, please mute yourself. Um, yeah, so the next question actually may be for Henning. This is something that we've got on the form that people registered with us. Uh, and it's a question that we at Alibar keep uh, receiving this because we are on the recycling of waste. As you know, pet bottles, uh, those are our drink bottles. They are now popularly recycled into what's called yarn, and to make t-shirts. In fact, the whole Mumbai Indians team, the cricket team, the IPL team, uh, proudly post that their t-shirts are 100% recycled uh, from pet bottle yarn. And uh, are there any theories or research done uh, to uh, kind of address the nanoplastics that come out every time you wash a recycled shirt? Uh, why is it important to have an an organic shirt is uh, what do we do with plastic bottles? I mean, if we recycle them in Japan and make shirts, uh, are we making seen waste? I always say seen waste becomes unseen waste, toxins in the water and the air. But what are your thoughts on this, Henning? Yeah. So um, I, I wanted just to add to the question before, um, what can governments do? Actually, when um, COVID came, um, I, I think, um, I don't know if it was the Ministry for Textile or the Indian government, they tried to lower the standards in textile industry to make sure that they survive and they don't suffer from cancel audit and so on. And all the uh, major uh, textile brands in Germany that do into organic and sustainability, along with the German Ministry for Foreign Development, signed a paper and sent it across to the Indian government with the value of goods that they buy from India pushing the government from India to not lower the standards, saying that we are willing to take the orders and keeping in touch with them. So governments are already doing uh, something and interfering into the supply chain. Also with this German um, green button, the certificate, something is already um, there and done by the governments, but it's still in the early stage. Um, regarding the um, polyester or the um, recycled polyester, actually it's... Um, it's a very difficult um, fiber um, for several reasons. I mean, it always sounds nice if you do something new out of something old, like you take a tire from a wheel and you make a sole for a shoe out of it, or you take a plastic bottle and you make a yarn and later a t-shirt out of it. But you have to keep in mind that um, the material that you now use to make it, uh, to turn it into a garment, or sometimes even um, your mouth if it's a scarf or a hat to your eyes. So it's very close uh, to your body. And um, a tire or a plastic bottle um, or plastic in general is mostly not made to be very close to your body. So in other words, it quite often contains toxic materials. And if you start collecting um, all plastic bottles um, and melt them and try to make a new yarn out of it, it might become even more toxic because of chemical reactions and it becomes even worse if you take it out of the ocean. I mean, there are many brands that claim that they take plastic from the ocean, they melt it and they make a new yarn out of it. I mean, it's a fantastic story and it seems to be very cool, but in the end, uh, nobody asked about the question, how healthy is the material? And if you would really send it to a laboratory, it would fail in many standards because it contains a lot of uh, pollution and toxic ingredients. So, um, and the second disaster about the story of recycled polyester or polyester in general is if you wash it, um, it um, releases microplastic and you have plastic again in the ocean. So it's, we call it um, a rebound effect. You want to do something good uh, by cleaning the ocean or by taking all plastic bottles to make something out of it. But in the end, uh, what you create is, is something um, bad or with an issue because you didn't thought about what is the result of it. 
So there, there is definitely good uh, man-made fibers in the market that you can that are environmental friendly. But if you start mixing and blending blindly uh, trash, you can create big problems. So you really have to look thoroughly before you start something. And most fashion brands are doing it because it's the cheapest fiber in the market. So it's not because it's sustainable, it's the cheapest fiber. That point. And uh, so I think we have uh, lots of questions that are there in the chat box uh, that uh, people have asked. And, uh, you know, uh, there's a lot of interest here. So in the interest of time, uh, what we're going to do is uh, maybe take a few more before we wrap if everybody's okay with that. Uh, we can like ask one or two more questions uh, that we need to uh, before we wrap up. So one more question that's uh, come up is for Kanishta. And uh, Kanishta, uh, this is like on a personal note. Uh, we have got this in our form. So I'm going to try and address some form questions as well. Uh, why someone like you would, you know, join a movement that's green and uh, you know leave the glamour and glitterati uh, you know or imbibe it and make it a habit so what what motivates people like you and are there more people like you uh, you know who are influencers who are making a contribution in the fashion world taking this step uh, do you see more people like yourself and what motivates you you know it should be a message for all of us so that we also get motivated uh, to join this um, yes. I, I think what motivates me is love for the planet and also love for love for a healthy life. I think it's really important to understand that everything it's it's for me it's that being alive is creating waste. It's parallel to that. So as human beings, being alive, we will always take from nature, no matter where we go. If you look at old civilizations or you look at cavemen or the agricultural revolution as human beings we'll always change our environment but are we able to do this holistically and i feel like in that regard we do have a choice and it's very simple it's just how we think it's the choices that we make on a daily basis opposed to leaving the planet an unsafer and dirtier place i think it's realizing that there's one planet there might be different countries you know but there's one planet, the earth is one, the resources are limited. So for me, all of these things come together and that's my driving force. And, and I know that it takes a lot of changing habits for people to make this a part of their daily life. But I feel like as, as human beings, maybe it's our biggest flaw is that until something happens to us directly, until something impacts us so badly, we don't realize how to deal with the situation. For example, COVID. I feel like Corona is the best teacher for this, for this question. We've all been forced to stop doing what we're doing, living the way we do. But I think that what we don't need is a water problem. You know, today there's clean water running from our taps. In 10 years, the next pandemic could be no water you know, to drink or to use in our homes. And I feel like we don't need to wait to that point, to get to that point of discomfort, to do something and change something. And that is my biggest motivator. And I do, and I do hope there are more people like me. I feel like today, everyone who's joined are more people like me. So for me, uh, you know, gatherings like this are always a positive, motivating uh, sign. And I do hope there are more influencers with like a lot more following, millions and millions of followers on Instagram who could carry the movement, you know, because that would there be nothing else like it. Uh, Henning, your uh, leaving message or takeaway for all the attendees uh, here today, you know, have you had any challenge being a sustainable brand and why do you hang in there and you know how do you make money make sustainability a norm uh, you know I, i'm amazed to see the number of euros that have been spent to r d on the shoe in fact at rur we do a lot of r d to make um, decentralized waste management a reality and for small companies i know it takes a lot to put money into r d and i see you're doing that 
uh, especially in the cradle to cradle side so what's your challenge uh, what advice can you give more green entrepreneurs like yourself to hang in there and you know spend money at the right place uh, and you know what's your message for them i i think the the am i on mute yeah i think the challenge is um that end consumers do not always honor what you do and instead they honor something that is done by others that is not nearly as close in terms of sustainable sustainability what you do so the challenge is you invest and you do a lot and you take care of a lot of things but end consumers don't care too much about it because it's too difficult for them to differentiate so you compete with others that do much less so they can save a lot of money and they can use that money for marketing and their noise is much louder than ours so that's the biggest challenge but on the other hand what uh, encourages us as a team at Melaware is that we see that the trend is there and that it's growing and that we do have a very good partners in india that we work with that we uh, can trust on and rely on and um because that's most important i mean you have to make sure that on the sourcing end you have good partners to grow with and um because if the demand picks up which is happening right now or at least for us as a brand is you need to make sure that your supply chain is stable and um that you can um please the demand so um that's the challenge and um yeah like what i realized also like like at in covid or corona times is we realized that uh, fashion brands and sustain uh, that are sustainable or sustainably driven had much less issues than fashion brands or producers that do conventionally business so it seems that the sustainable supply chain is much more um uh, resistant against shocks or issues than conventional ones and i think that shows clearly that it's better to do it uh, sustainably than conventionally because in the long run it will pay off even the the efforts great that's yeah so wishing you all the best at melaware i want to thank larissa larissa you want to give any message to our participants here um, you're a yoga teacher as well uh, henning is your student <laughs> So, uh, you know, you've lived in India for five years. Uh, was it easy for you to live a sustainable life? I know you buy a lot of organic products. And what's your message for our friends here? Um, yeah, I think um, it is slightly easier in Germany. Um, the availability of organic fair trade products is more, but still, um, definitely the awareness is growing, at least in Mumbai, you know, where I was living um and um yeah just trying to live more mindfully and conscious which is something that is in indian society taught in yoga so um i think that that's already yeah that's already there thanks larissa and uh, you know uh, we have both henning larissa kanishka parthi are you our family and uh, we welcome you all to you know keep writing to us at info at rur.co.in uh, your queries i'm i hope we've addressed some if you've missed out do forgive us and you know it's just been an hour on webinar it's tough to address everybody but you know feel free to write to us we'll ensure your questions get answered you can join us on instagram at rur green life we're there on facebook linkedin uh, so stay tuned and today on this uh, you know great day of talking sustainability uh, we have joined hands, actually Kanishtha and we have joined hands for many years, but we've decided, uh, Kanishtha attended one of our webinars some time back, and she said, you know, in an hour, it, it can't become a habit change, and what can I do to help? And we came up with this idea of making a series of videos um, so that we can stay connected with people, take their queries, uh, you know, handhold them step by step on what they should do towards a cleaner, greener planet. And I'm happy to launch uh, our video series with Kanishtha in association with Ariwar. It's called Planet Positive with Kanishtha. And the first video is here. Uh, I'd like to request a few more minutes. It's a quick three minute video. And then we'll wrap up for the day. Uh, the idea of showing you all the video is just to get your feedback. Let us know what you think, what kind of videos you'd like us to make, 
Uh, and we would love for you to share these videos with your um, network of people, make it grow. We'd like Germany also to talk about the videos we're making here, give us some inputs. Uh, so I'm going to launch Planet Positive with Kanishtha for you today. I'm watching Planet Positive with Kanishtha. It's really simple. The first step is segregating at home. And so in this first video to get you started, I want to share with you simple steps that I've been doing at home for a couple of years and that's going to get you started on your journey. I've collected some of the things that I've used since morning just to show you to do a bit of a waste audit. So uh, what I have here is some eggshells from the morning, some coffee grounds that you get from making coffee, just some, you know, leaves and stuff, some um, onion, some onion peels, green tea leaves. Uh, so this is all, this is all your wet waste. Anything that is biodegradable is called wet waste. So anything that comes from nature and can go back to nature is your wet waste and your biodegradable waste. Now here I have a pile of things that I have collected, for example, just paper or cardboard or for example, a box of chocolate, an empty box of chocolate my favorite chocolate, Royce, um, just plastic bottles, you know, used yogurt cups. I, I wash them, I rinse them after I've used them. And Tetra Pak cartons that you get your milk or your juice. All of this is called dry waste and this is man-made waste. Anything that needs to be recycled through man-made waste is called dry waste. And then you have the third kind of waste which is maybe your used or soiled pizza boxes, broken pieces of glass that can't be recycled. And that is your third kind of waste. So it's really important to keep them separately. And um, simple segregation methods at home. I actually have three bins at home, which really helps me with the process because then I'm not thinking and wondering where I should put what. So I have three bins here that I use that I want to show you. The first is the green bin where I put all my wet waste, which is all my biodegradable waste. In the blue bin, I put all my dry waste, which is recyclable waste. And in the black bin is where I put my trash for what goes on Amazon. Or you can just buy any color bins at the market, at your closest market. It doesn't matter what color the bins are. It's just for you to identify it for yourself so that you get in the practice of doing it. And yeah, don't worry about the color of the bins, just start segregating at home. Keep watching, lots of love. So uh, three cheers to Kanishtha for Plant Positive and Namaste from all of us here. Thank you, Henning, from the bottom of my heart. A big gratitude to you, to Larissa, and also to um, Henning's um, team member, Katha, who is a dear friend of mine. Actually, we were hoping she could be here. Uh, she did all the efforts to put us all together here. So uh, my special thanks to Katha, Katrina. Uh, she couldn't make it today, but we remember her uh, being part of the uh, program because she helped uh, with the whole session uh, facilitation. So a big thank you to her. Uh, a big thank you to my husband, Amit Narki. He introduced me to Henning and to Melaware and uh, connected me to the organic movement, which is very close to our heart. So uh, to my family and to all my RUR team members, Dr. Parna Pandey, uh, Sunny Gangar, Aditi, uh, the whole uh, force behind RUR who, you know, work day and night to bring people together towards a high level of eco-consciousness. So my special thanks to RUR team for hanging in, uh, saying to all for the sustainable movement. And uh, we're looking forward to working with you, Kanishna, on many more projects. This is uh, kind of a great journey together. Uh, and we look forward to you connecting us to more influencers like yourself so we can take this mission far and wide. Uh, special thank you once again. Uh, good evening and um, 
I call this webinar adjourned. Uh, do stay in touch. Uh, start living the green life uh, daily. Make it a part of your living and stay tuned with RUR at www.rur.co.in. Thank you, everybody. Stay safe, stay sustainable. Ciao. Thank you, Take everyone. Thank you, Hemi. Thank, Thank, Thank you, Kata. Thank you, everyone. Take care. Bye bye.